I'd like to um, welcome back to uh, Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And uh, we are now working on H546 and actually relating to racial justice statistics. And I would like to turn the meeting over to Representative Coach Christie, who has provided an enormous amount of leadership on this bill to, uh, to chair the meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, so I guess, uh, are we going to do another read through? Uh, I see Amarin's here or. Uh, I was thinking that we, could, that we could go right to the witnesses. Okay, and then, great. Um, and certainly if witnesses have questions or questions come up um, for, for counsel for Amarin, we can certainly um, direct them her way. And, and I, okay. I do invite her to uh, join in. Thank you. Hi, Amarin. Good to see you. So I guess uh, what we'll do if um, we can start with uh, Rebecca Turner and then go to Judge Grierson. Rebecca, how are you? Good, thank you, Representative Christie. Um, for the record, Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General and um, panel member of RDAP. So thank you for inviting me um, today. And I guess I'll kick off with um, with my reactions to uh, the bill. Um, I, I, I was able to hear some of the, most of the walkthrough yesterday and um, try to include in this some of the uh, questions raised yesterday by some of the committee members. Um, but let's, I was just gonna go through this from the beginning. I think by way of introduction, uh, the, our position on this project throughout the summer and uh, certainly as included in the report that RDAP submitted to the legislature in November of last year, uh, supported a, a design of this entity with something that was fundamentally ensuring the integrity and independence of, of it so that the, um, the product, the end product would not be questioned, that it could be something that, that you, that the public, that all of us could turn to and rely and trust. Uh, and so with that, um, the Office of the Defender General has always uh, sort of turned to where we thought the obvious placeholder for uh, such an entity would be. Um, we've consistently recommended that it be considered placed in the Office of the Secretary of State. Uh, certainly um, a governmental body with long experience with handling data governance and um, which is the repository of large amounts of data. Uh, alternatively, we have recommended the Office of the Auditor, uh, again, with substantial experience with, with data analysis. I understand this bill is zeroing in on the uh, on creating this entity within the agency of administration uh, my comments here today are focusing on how uh, perhaps some changes can be made within this proposal. I just want to make it clear that still ideally speaking, um, this doesn't change our position that this be removed from the AOA, that we uh, that this be built still within uh, um, a, a less politicized branch, uh, agency or department within the executive branch. So that said, um, and that's something I've expressed previously with members here, but I won't uh, belabor that and we'll move on. Uh, and looking at this from the position proposed here within the agency administration, I wanted to focus on page five of this bill. And that is, let me get there. Page five, and it's section 5013, data governance. I, wouldn't, I wanted to jump here because I know you have a, a long lineup of witnesses who will have more expertise to dive into some of the other details uh, of this bill. What struck me here um, and really of concern was A1, um, A1 of this data governance um, section establishes right up front that the data collected pursuant to this um, project 
would not be considered public records, effectively exempting um, the work of this new governmental entity from being subject to longstanding um, public records laws in Vermont. Uh, and that's how I read that section A1. I thought that was my sit up straight moment of making sure the committee understood the significance of that. It certainly is not a, a proposal that we would support at the Defender General's office um, because I think what comes thereafter is sort of a, what I read as an attempt to create essentially what our public records laws already provide, uh, a, a structure of governance, a structure of protection, um, privacy protection, and also ensuring sufficient public access when that's already set out by uh, the, the um, Public Records Act. So I would encourage this committee to, to, not, um, to not reject that. I think that we have certainly been concerned throughout um, the buildup in the panel over the summer discussion, and certainly from the Office of the Defender General's perspective, concerned with the privacy protections of the individuals captured in the data for sure. We're concerned with the data themselves being transparent enough to the public and all of us to understand and trust it, right? So we certainly want there to be both sufficient protections of data that's already classify as confidential under law, or even if it's not uh, confidential, that it doesn't reveal uh, too much privacy and, 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 and um, make these individuals, individuals vulnerable in a way they weren't previously. Uh, and I do think that the Public Records Act provides those kinds of protections already, right? There are clearly defined terms of what a public record is versus what is publicly available what um, what exemptions um, are in place so that certain public information is not actually made publicly available, even if it falls within the definition of public record, right? So I don't see that system as lacking in any way. In fact, what I understand, again, I'm not the expert on uh, the Public Records Act, but my understanding is that I believe every other governmental entity within Vermont is subject to it. So I'm not quite sure what or why this new entity would, uh, would warrant exception. Um, it seems to me perhaps an inadvertent uh, uh, creation of a fundamentally new type of governmental entity that wasn't intended. So just wanted to put that red flag front and center. I think that that issue then addresses sort of the remainder of the data governance language that goes on from five to six. Um, but let's stay on page five. Uh, after data collection, there is about um, section in A2 about requiring um, access to this division, would be able to get access to all of the state agency data. Um, establishing data sharing agreements and such. Again, I think this is a, a mechanism that's already set out uh, in the Public Records Act uh, statutory scheme. Um, I was before speaking with you today, I was trying to get a better handle on this area of law and I spoke with Tanya Marshall, uh, the state archivist. Uh, within, which is of course within the office of the Secretary of State. And I would encourage you to um, actually invite her to come and, and, and you can hear it directly from the expert on, on this issue, but my understanding is that the, 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 they do this regularly in terms of establishing data sharing uh, within different government agencies and branches. So they have the working materials, the language. Um, there were questions I know yesterday about whether or not there would be concerns, whether this branch of government could pass a law requiring a different branch of government to share to the third branch of government, right? And, and my understanding is that is something that has been regularly done and um, uh, through the state archivist's office and as established by statute, establishing the jurisdiction of that office 
in, in, in that sort of data sharing setting. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I was just, I'm sorry, I was just scrolling. Um, oh, there's oh, a question, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, Martin? Uh, yeah, thank you for, for pointing those uh, points out, uh, Ms. Turner, that, that's actually quite helpful and we'll definitely explore right. that a little bit further. But I had a couple questions while you're on this uh, page, a couple things for you to perhaps weigh in on, maybe you're not ready to weigh in on right now, but um, a couple of things that I just want to have various witnesses weigh in on. Uh, first of all, it's um, the concept of having the division establishing by rule uh, the data elements that are to be collected and the pluses and minuses to doing it in that manner. Uh, with the rule, of course, it would have to go through rulemaking and there's definitely some positives. There's definitely some pros to doing it that way, uh, such as ensuring participation and determining what should be part of it, you know, that, that it's going through a particular process, uh, that we have some consistency uh, and also some stability as far as the data elements that we're after, because if, uh, and, and I'm, I'm comparing that not to having us set it statutorily, but just having the division come up with the data that they need through consulting with RDAP and the advisory council without going through the rulemaking process. Uh, you know, the con is that it takes a little longer, but that's actually in some respects could also be considered a pro because we don't want the data elements to be changing frequently, you know, we, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty big uh, lift, presumably, uh, for some of these agencies to be able to, you know, gather that data, and we don't want to keep changing the, changing what's required of them. Uh, but I did want, you know, if you have any input on that, if you're fine with the process that we're talking about uh, here, uh, so that's one question. I'll, I'll, I'll hold, I'll let you ponder that for a second. Uh, before I ask the second question that I had, but if you, well, have, any, if you have any input on that right now, but I do have I do have a general uh, uh, general response. Although I, I was just trying to find the exact language this morning, I was listening in on on House General Ops, where a similar question was raised. It was in the context of traffic stops, and um, Dr. Stephanie Sanguino was testifying and making a recommendation that that additional data points be included to better fill in some of the gaps in, in what it is now being able to be understood and analyzed. And the question then came up there, sort of what you're asking here, which is, which is do, we, do we set it out by statute, the requirements of what exact data points are needed such that when we realize one year, two years, three years later, that we actually want one or two or five more? that we have to come back and get seek amendment right here i hear you saying it would be through a rulemaking process rather than sort of leaving it to the individual the bodies the council or however to to form it and i think that my general response would be instinct would be to to defer to not micromanage those details by statute or by rule and, and let that uh, go through the the process, as I understand this bill is setting up, uh, the process of, of the council meeting. Um, but I may have misunderstood that in the details of reading yeah, I think, this bill. Yeah, I think definitely, the, the, and I, I actually read uh, Dr. Seguino's uh, testimony, and she likes that we're getting away from defining the items on uh, in legislation. Agreed with that, definitely agree with that. Uh, and now the question is rulemaking versus uh, essentially policy making, and there's pluses and minuses to to both of those. Um, and I appreciate you giving us some input, and that's certainly something we want to hear from other members of RDAP and any of the other witnesses that testify. The other question is related, and that is whether we need whether you think we need to, even though we're not defining the data elements, you know, specifically like we did in H317, whether we should at least put in here the categories uh, of, of documents that we want or the entities from which we want. You know, essentially, I think in, in H317 for a number of the uh, areas where we wanted documents, it, it kind of provided a broad definition and then, you know, went into details. And I'm wondering if we need a little more detail or if that would be helpful 
I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but that's a question I, I'm just having uh, various witnesses. Yeah, and, I, and I'm afraid I don't have an, uh, a quick answer to your question. I understand it, and I almost uh, would want to hear from people who have been, you know, whether it's Dr. Stephanie Sanguinos or others who, who have been trying to get data and to analyze to see what has been the challenges there and whether it would be easier to see it in statute or not. Um, so I'll, I'll defer answering. Well, we can always we can always come back uh, when you have a chance, uh, 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 Attorney uh, Turner, uh, to formulate your position, so to speak. Thank you, thank you, Coach. If I could, if I may just add one more before um, before uh, yielding the floor, unless there are any other questions. It's it's it looks like I'm on page. Five. Um, again, this is in the general section on data governance uh, and the reference here. I've been talking about the public records law and the concern about not exempting this entity from being subject to those laws. Uh, the other is, is the reference to the Agency of Digital Services and what I read here as sort of a general approach of treating ADS as the as the entity that would be doing the overall data management or governance and again I I defer to others who um, have expertise in this area of, and you know they're talking with Michelle uh, Tanya Marshall uh, state archivist and and looking at some of the statutes in terms of jurisdiction and, and who is dealing with the um, data governance uh, on these issues. I understand it's it's not ADS, but it is, um, again, within the, the state records um, administration, within Secretary of State's office. So I, I just flag that there for section three, page five as well. I think that will make more sense uh, when read in the context of the, of the Public Records Act. Um, I think other than that, I was just going to jump to the council language addressing and the creation of the council. And I appreciated and recognized this as mirroring uh, RDAP's report, which recommended establishing a body made up of a certain government um, representatives in the criminal juvenile justice systems, as well as members, uh, key community members. Um, and here I see that there has been um, specific interests, uh, I guess, pe representative interests that, that this committee wanted to make sure was covered on the council. And I wanted to just zero in on um, the non-governmental council members being proposed here. I appreciated the six individuals being listed here. I'm looking at page eight. And one of the things that I wanted that caught my eye was that I thought there was insufficient representation of people who are actually in the um, criminal and juvenile systems themselves. There are of course, people who are experiencing facing evictions and and you know moving to Vermont as an immigrant and refugee, uh, being um, subject to law enforcement misconduct. Um, one of the things here was, I thought, a collapsing of issues of treatment, mental health, substance abuse uh, issues in in five line fourteen. Um, I guess that's L5. And I, I thought that that warranted further unpackaging and, and actually more representation to not just reduce all of those really critical issues. Because as someone who is in works intimately with this, with this court system, it is heavily uh, represented by people with um, substance abuse disorders, people with mental health, to only include just one uh, person to represent all of those issues, I think, is not doing that justice. Certainly, um, what we saw being reported with CSG, uh, um, racial disparities report, 
and zeroing in on um, all the disparities on, on drug offenses, for instance, shows just how important, you know, just one area can be in terms of overrepresentation of being subject to disparities in the system. So I just I just put that out there as well that I'd like to see more um, more representation on the council with with that. And I think that's it for now. Unless there are any other questions, I will um, I will pass the torch. Thank you, Attorney Turner. Oh, uh, Representative Colburn. Yeah, it's actually not a question for Attorney Turner, but thank you so much for your testimony. It's just, um, I think it's like a technical correction. I think we're trying to change references to substance abuse, statutory references to substance use disorder. So we may want to just flag that change. And I would, right, right. but if I didn't say it now, I'd probably forget it later. So. I, I see Amron uh, nodding her head, so duly noted. Thank you. Uh, Judge Grierson, sir. Good afternoon, Coach. Good to see you. Good to see you as always. And uh, thank the committee for the invitation. Um, I will, um, I was saying earlier, it's like old times. Uh, it's good to be back before the before the committee. I will correct one thing on the agenda. It, it listed me as the witness as chief superior judge and I don't wanna take anything away from Judge Zone. So uh, for the record, um, Brian Grierson, the uh, former uh, chief superior judge. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably here before this committee today with two hats, uh, neither of which I wear at the present time, one as a member of RDAP and one as the um, former chief superior judge. And so my comments um, will, will kind of relate to both, uh, both those entities. Um, I, I will say that <clears throat> I, I'm, I am no longer involved with RDAP. I wasn't uh, present for the last few meetings, um, but I, I will say that uh, having certainly read the report and approved the report as issued, um, I believe that this, um, this bill in its present form uh, is consistent with the, certainly what the, the uh, RDAP uh, board panel uh, was hoping uh, to accomplish in this sense. And, and I'll add um, my, their more personal comments, that not as a member of the judiciary, but as a member of RDAP. I uh, have always felt that the appropriate uh, entity for this work uh, was within the Office of, of Racial Equity. And so I think um, by designating, uh, and I understand the concerns raised by, by um, Rebecca, uh, and she did uh, voice those uh, throughout the, the uh, time when we were working on this. And I, I, I feel uh, personally that uh, this is the right, right place for, for this work uh, to be overseen. So I, I would encourage the committee to uh, continue to pursue this as the appropriate entity. And I believe um, that from, from a policy perspective where uh, committee members will know from, from past, uh, I do not comment on policy um, as, a, as a representative of the judiciary. Um, and so I will not uh, venture into that area today as a member of the judiciary primarily because this does call for uh, the creation, if you will, of a, an executive, uh, a new entity in the executive branch. And I, I believe that could potentially have conflicts uh, with the, uh, with the, our branch of the government. So I, I don't want to go there, but I will say as a member of RDAP, a, a longtime member of RDAP, um, I think this bill and the uh, efforts of, of RDAP are reflected in this bill um, and I think the policy is important. Uh, I think, uh, to me, the, the work of the uh, gathering the data um, is critical um, for both the, the criminal and juvenile justice system. And, and I believe that this data, this information uh, will 
better informed, certainly all of the entities, but from the judicial perspective, certainly better inform uh, the judges and the courts um, and make for better, more informed decisions around these issues that, that really bring us here today. So uh, as a member of RDAP, um, I, I think this is appropriate policy. And from the judiciary perspective, I think uh, the, the judges will welcome this, uh, this information when it, when it is available. So I just wanted to make that clear from, from, from both hats that I am wearing. Um, I, I did um, confer with uh, uh, Judge Zone, the new chief superior judge, um, and you may want to hear from him uh, directly or from uh, the acting uh, trial court operations uh, in, in discussing this uh, bill in its present form with, with Judge Zone. Neither he nor I saw that uh, the adoption of this bill uh, would have an adverse impact on the court, at least in terms of its operations. Uh, so we do not see any uh, impact in that sense. And other than, as I said, I think the information that will be produced by this entity uh, will better inform the court and make for more informed decisions. Um, but again, you may, you may want to hear from him in that respect. Um, I would um, just follow up um, some of Rebecca's comments when I looked at the individuals or the entities, if you will, who are to make up the advisory council, um, she touched on um, the issues around substance abuse disorder, mental health. I would at least uh, ask the committee to um, consider including a provider of those services as a member um, of that advisory council. So you're not only hearing from individuals impacted by uh, those uh, issues, but the provider of services relating to those issues, which I think could contribute um, substantially to the advisory council. So I, again, because I, I'm, I'm no longer involved in, in either, I, I did want to uh, uh, let the committee know that as a, as a member of our ADAP, we, I do support this. Um, and I think it reflects the work that we've done there. It was a consensus report. There are issues as Rebecca has pointed out and I'm sure other witnesses will identify areas where they may disagree. Um, but um, I think this is the appropriate entity and we do not see any um, adverse impact on, on court operations if this bill was adopted. Um, and with that, I, I do not have any other testimony, but I'm available for any uh, questions if there are any. Representative Long. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Judge Grierson. It's very good to see you again. Um, so I, I'll ask the same question of whether you have any input on whether uh, this should be through a rulemaking for defining the data or, or if you have any problems with the division uh, deciding on its own through policy and through consultation with RDAP and the advisory council to come up with the data that is needed. If you have any input on that. You know, I, I was obviously listening to your uh, questions and Rebecca's response. I, I have not given that area a lot of thought, uh, Representative Wuhan. I, I tend to favor personally the, the latter approach as opposed to the rule. But that may very well be, and if you'd like, I'll carry that uh, question back to Judge Zone, um, and, and um, he may have some uh, independent thoughts on that that um, I'm bearing that issue. So I'll be glad to uh, convey that question to him, and you may want to hear from him directly on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, there? Uh, I guess we will go to uh, Ms. Susanna Davis, Executive Director of the Office of Racial Equity. Thank you, Coach, and thank the committee for the opportunity to appear before you. Uh, and I will uh, sign off at this point. I'll listen in as long as I can. Um, Good to see everyone and good to see Representative Gosselin is still on the committee. 
um, and couldn't help but saying hello to him. Thank you. Pearson. And uh, we will probably invite you back just for uh, old, old home sakes. You, you, you call me back anytime you want, Coach. I got I'll be, you. I'll be there. Hello. Thank Ken. you. Good to see you. Miss Davis. I should say Attorney Davis. Oops. Are you muted? Sorry, I was double muted. Uh, I was saying Attorney Davis feels weird. I'd be fine with Ms. Davis. <laughs> um, what, buenos and, dias, as always. Yes, when I started this. Um, with, with respect, Representative, I just want to make sure I'm not stepping on anyone else. I know that I was scheduled to go way, way later this afternoon, and I don't want to, to make some of my other colleagues wait longer to give their testimony if they were up with me. Well, well, judging, uh, it would be you and then um, uh, Robin Joy. So um, being that we're in that part of the discussion, uh, it would seem to make a little sense to, uh, to get your thoughts and then we'll continue into the data discussion. Okay, you got it. So for the record, uh, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. And I am happy to be back again in this committee discussing this matter. I know that we've had a lot of conversations over the last year before Act 65 had been passed. And since then, the Executive Director of Racial Equity was also made a member of the Racial Disparities Panel. And so there now exists a formal membership relationship there. And of course, the proposal on the table is whether to create a division of racial justice statistics in what would become the Office of Racial Equity in agency administration. My thoughts are brief and they will mirror largely what they were last year, which is that this work is needed and that the fine details of data sharing, public access, et cetera, must be worked out in a way that protects public uh, excuse me, that, that protects privacy and the privacy of the information who are represented in those data, but that also encourages uh, openness and transparency of government, not just state, but also local. Uh, still, just as last year, also agree with the goals of the work. And the only question I think that remains, and it is a big question, is where to cite such a division. Uh, we know that the Office of Racial Equity is cited in the agency of administration because it is statewide work, much like tax and general services and risk management is statewide. Um, it is a bit of an odd fit for the agency of administration and it's not that it hasn't been a very welcome home for this work, it's been a wonderful team. Uh, but we just, you know, I think about the, the build out of the Office of Racial Equity and at what point does it tip to be substantively um, out of sync with the, the remaining departments in AOA? And the related issue with that is um, the question of the focus of the Office of Racial Equity and mm -hmm. the addition of this division. Again, though sorely needed in state government, also does make the mm -hmm. office's work lean very criminal justice heavy. And if that is what's needed, then we would certainly welcome the work. Um, but we just wanna make sure that we don't, in so doing, shift priorities deeper into criminal justice to the expense of other matters. I don't think I said that coherently, but I hope that you understood the point of that one. And um, yeah, I mean, I. The RDAP has worked very, very hard in producing the recommendation and, you know, the bill, I think, has been extremely meticulously drafted. So I don't want to bore you by telling you what you already know about it. So I think I'm just going to pause there. And of course, I welcome any questions or feedback. Hands. Yes. 
Representative Lalonde. I was holding off to let somebody else <laughs> raise their hand first. Uh, of course, I was going to raise my hand. Um, so I, I have some a couple broad or a broad question, uh, and it goes to what you identified as the big question. Um, and, and you did mention some pluses and minuses, certainly, to where the location is. But uh, I guess the question is: is where? I mean you're a representative of the administration and do you, I mean, is this a fine look, is this an acceptable location for the administration or is that going beyond your pay grade to, to make that final, final call? I think, I think it might be beyond my pay grade to make that final call. What I will say from my perch in the admin is that if this is where the work was cited, we would do it and we would do it to the best of our ability. Okay. Um, so, so I guess a follow-up question is, are, are there other individuals uh, within the administration, be in A of A, uh, the, the agency of administration or elsewhere uh, that we should uh, have way in on this or testify so we can get this right? I'd rather not get this all the way through this long process to send it to the to the governor who is not on board. I mean, I think I think particularly uh, given the involvement uh, of folks uh, in the governor's office, certainly uh, in the justice reinvestment process, which this work is definitely following right from that. Uh, so so are there particular individuals, you don't have to tell me now, but but I think we definitely want to make sure it, as early in this process as possible to make sure that we are in the, hopefully on the same page, if not at least the same chapter uh, of, of the book on, on where we're putting this. Um, so, and I don't know if you have any input on that right now, or if that's something you can ponder and get back to us on. Yes, Representative. I think that it would be good to make sure that we've heard from ADS. I know that the uh, Chief Data Officer has been looped into the RDAP discussions when they were happening, but it may be good just to hear again from ADS, particularly around the data infrastructure and the data governance for pieces. And then the certainly couldn't hurt to hear from the Secretary's office. We have had a change in leadership since the last time we had this conversation, and we now have um, sort of a, a little bit more steadiness in there, especially on the operational front. So perhaps the Deputy Secretary might be able to, to share a little bit about the operational impact that this, this might create. Great, I appreciate that. The, Thank the other, you. The other question was more of a general question that I asked the other folks. If you have any, uh, at this point, a viewpoint on uh, rulemaking versus essentially determining the data in, in policy, uh, if you have any input on that at this point. Yes. So. Yeah, I, I, I was um, present for the live stream of yesterday's walkthrough, so I know that this committee has already been briefed on the fact that the rulemaking authority would be granted to the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, and it might be a bit of a, an inescapable bias on my part. I think we would do a great job at the rulemaking process. However, um, at the end of the day, again, you want to create something that is transparent, that is accessible to the public, understandable by the public, and that can adapt and flex with the needs as they present themselves. Because what we find sometimes is that we're noticing a disparity or a particular pattern, but because the relevant data may not be listed out in statute, it might be difficult to encourage or compel any agency from being able to provide it. So having the flexibility to be able to adjust the list of data as needed um, could be helpful. And the ability to, and you know, this was a big part of last year's discussion as well, which is how narrowly are we going to focus on race and are we going to be inclusive of intersectional identities for example, we know that members of the LGBTQIA plus population also experience disparate negative impacts in policing. So when you pair race and orientation or sexual identity, we're looking at the epidemic of trans women of color who are being assaulted and murdered at higher rates than any other members of the LGBTQIA plus population. So intersection is really important. And so as we think about what data are relevant for these purposes, being able to go through a process that allows for that level of um, insight, foresight, and flexibility, I think is key. 
I'm not even sure that I answered your question. It sounds, I, I think that on one hand, uh, rulemaking provides that opportunity for all that various input, uh, and it's much more transparent than just uh, policy, presumably. But it's also a little bit less flexible because it takes a little time, obviously, to go through the rulemaking process. So I heard pros and cons for both of them from you, if, that is, if that's an accurate interpretation of what you said. Yes. Yeah, that, I, I, that's what I heard, too. <laughs> Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Susanna. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You know, especially with uh, when we when we did the original uh, discussion um, of the the bill before it went into the mis mis miscellaneous uh, judiciary bill. Uh, I think you had mentioned uh, the same concern about the intersectionality. Uh, and and that's critical uh, in today's day and age um, that we get that piece right. So thank you for reiterating uh, that point. Representative Gosland. Thank you. Good afternoon, Susanna. Susanna. Um, so we don't even know yet if the uh, if the current administration is on board with with uh, ex expanding your office or creating a new board, um, and a, a, like what we did with the cannabis board. No, Representative, respectfully, I wouldn't say that that's accurate, and maybe I didn't frame it correctly. Um, I think that the administration supports this work and supports creating this division and is also just struggling with the question of how to structure it and where to structure it, so in a way that makes sense and that's scalable in the future. So let me rephrase that. So expanding it is, a, is what they had in mind um, with this whole thing then, correct? Expanding, expanding uh, the the members, expand, ex, expanding uh, people to work with you more on it, probably directly with you. Yes. For you, I should say. Within like the you. office. W within the office. Great, great way of putting it, Coach. Thanks. Th thank, uh, thank you. One of the other things, uh, Representative, uh, in the enabling statute, there is data disaggregation and work that is required of the office, and it hadn't been fully, or I should say totally addressed, and that, I think, enabled, uh, let's say, a, a little easier uh, decision point you know, I, I would think on the part of the administration because it's already in existing statute that some of the data work needs to be done across all segments of state government. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's just so hard to, to follow everything through what we're trying to do because everything is coming at everybody uh, at rapid pace now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, what it obviously this is very important work and what are we trying to do um how soon are we going to do how soon are we going to get it done and what's feasible and with it with the information that we have like we already uh, you know i i i i think we're missing some some critical data in some areas already but uh, I think it's attainable. So, and and I think uh, uh, Susanna is doing an excellent job too. By the way, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, any other comments um, uh, from uh, our our guests uh, or committee members? Uh, seeing no hands. Um, I guess um, we'll continue our, our discussion uh, and testimony. Um,
Robin Joy, I think, is next. Hello. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, Robin. Yes, we can. Hi, how are you? Happy New Year, everyone. For the record, Robin Joy, Director of Research, Crime Research Group. Um, let's start with we agree uh, with this bill. Uh, we were a consultant with the subcommittee that met every Monday. Um, we agree that you should bring in the um, archivist on the issue of public record law. Uh, when we've worked with them in the past, they're wonderful. And there's some trip ups um, that we've had to be aware of uh, when we request and, and, and get data um, uh, from people. Uh, so um, it, it's, you know, uh, they're very well versed. This is their area. And we agree uh, with the Defender General that you should bring them in. We agree with Director Davis that you should bring in ADS, um, and I'll talk a little bit um, about that in a moment. And one quick addition to the list of people, um, and, um, and that would be we support uh, the letter from the Director of Crime Victim Services that um, victims should have representation, uh, as Director Davis just said, when you look at who are also victims of crimes and the racial and intersectional bias that happens there, and that we know that one day, you know, you could be a victim and one day you could be uh, an offender, that sometimes that distinction is made by somebody in power um, who is acting on implicit or explicit bias. And so I, I, my recollection of the creation of that list is that we talked about including them. I don't think it was an oversight, like an intentional, we are not going to do this. I refer to people's better memories, um, but I do want to just flag that this is a group that's missing um, and is equally impacted um, by racism and other um, other biases. Um, so those are the easy things. The other two things that I wanted to talk about today are the data and also a section that's missing, um, we think, of the bill. Um, but we'll start with the data, and I ask... Um, Ms. Amber, if she could put up that, the first data map and scroll down to the, what Aton calls the spaghetti image. Um, a parallel process, I wanna let you know that's going on here, um, independent of RDAP, is the National Criminal Justice Reform Project. And this has been something that's been going on in the state for five years. Um, everyone in the criminal justice system has been invited to participate. Uh, so it's all the usual players. And this, we have secured outside funding um, to begin the beginning of data integration processes. Uh, we have used um, the funding to fund a part-time six-month position in the Agency of Digital Services for a project manager. His name is Joe, and he has just started with the state. This is, I think, his eighth week, or, and, we're, and he's very happy. Um, and we're happy to have him. Um, this, this process, uh, when I talk about the beginning, the beginning, um, if you look at that m mess of data systems, all of those data systems have laws that govern them. Um, they have uh, people that govern them. They have restrictions on who can have access to the data and under, under what circumstances. There are all sorts of preliminary things that have to happen before you begin to take on this kind of massive data integration um, that is actually proposed here in this bill. And so we're using this funds, and right now it's just a small group of people that are meeting. It's myself and Monica Weber from the Department of Corrections, um, Joe from ADS, and then from DPS, um, some of their ADS staff, uh, just to begin to collect all the laws, all the restrictions on data so that we can have them in a place and kind of map out what needs to be done to get this data to the Office of um, or the Division of Racial Justice Statistics and any other stakeholders who want, like you, um, like the Sentencing Commission. Data integration is, is um, huge. Uh, part of this we are taking into account something that RDAP used that we refer to as the toolkit, um, and this is from the University of Pennsylvania, I believe, and it focuses on centering racial equity in data integration. 
Uh, in that end, to do so, we are constantly in communication uh, with one of your future witnesses, which ER2, from um, the NAACP and ATON um, from RDAP, in addition to informing our own stakeholders of the process. We expect a draft uh, charter to be done by the end of February that we'll be sharing with people. Um, so you can see the beginnings of those processes. But there, there's a lot that needs to be done in order to get all of these systems to talk to each other. The way that ADS describes it, which I think is helpful, is they consider it a data lake, that everyone's going to contribute data to this lake. And some of us are going to swim on the shallow end, and I always said that I'm going to claim the sunny side, and we're going to have access to certain information because this is what the permissions allow. Um, some people are going to have access to the whole lake because their permissions allow that. Uh, some people are going to have actions to half the lake. So creating a system of integration where the data can um, live together, get cross-referenced together, um, and then provide meaningful insight across the criminal and juvenile justice system and victims. Um, Like I said, we, we strongly encourage you to talk to ADS about this process. We disagree with the Defender General that um, they're not going to play a big role. They are, I think, um, but it's their, it's their role to talk about, not mine. Um, we are working with them uh, because right now they are controlling the data that we want to integrate. I should say that through this process, no data will actually be integrated. No data will be harmed. Um, because we are just really at the very beginning, beginning steps. Now, the toolkits that RDAP relied on, that's the division, my dog is about to bark in about five seconds, so I apologize, um, that, the, that the, um, the toolkit that was referenced um, says that you can begin to do this work with reports that already exist. And that's true, and we can, um, there, there are, for example, the extracts that I get from the Judiciary Monthly, that exists. Um, DOC has most of their data up on their website. It's public. You can download it, and it can be worked with. Um, so there is work that can begin um, within this division, with, inconsistent with uh, the toolkit. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that that can happen. Um, but it's going to be a long road uh, to integration. Uh, to Representative Lalonde's question on statute versus rulemaking, um, I'm in favor of rulemaking, and that's because words have meaning and they don't have the same meaning to everybody. Um, and the rulemaking process, I think, allows for that meaning to be kind of teased out and agreed upon. And one of the things we know about the work that we do is that having consensus going in about what the words mean, mean that the results um, have consensus, that we have always worked to build consensus in our, um, in our classification schemes, et cetera, so that when we say that DUI is worse than um, DLS, for example, we have all these agreements in place that, and you know, it's not necessarily formal agreements, but we have built the consensus that people agree that this is true. And that consensus helps um, lend legitimacy to the final result. So that's what I have about data. And before I move on to my next point and my last point, um, I want to ask if there's any questions, since I can't see anyone. If, um, OK, Representative Norse. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is probably not your flow chart, uh, Robin, but when it comes under police and it references Spillman and Valcor and then Little Spillman, I'm very familiar with Spillman and Valcor. Uh, if possible, could you comment somewhat on Little Spillman? Sure. That's um, Hartford and a few other agencies near there um, that have invested their their money into that instead of buying into the Spillman system when Spillman was the main system for the state. Um, they have, I understand, but don't take my word for it, um, remained on that system and have not made the transition to Valcor. Thank you. So is the entire state looking to transition to Valcor? As my understanding, they already have. Well, even the state Except for the, 
the little spillman. Um, that was the last thing I had heard a few weeks ago from ADS DPS. Um, so that, that transition has happened, but I want to warn you, you're still going to need data for, out of Spillman for this because the past matters, right? We're not going to have um, – you don't want to wait five years' worth of data, um, five years from now, to start analyzing data. There's a lot of data in Spillman, and if the state just uh, uh, transferred to Valcourse, it will take some time for them to shift all that information. It would be nice if we had one source to pull from, such as Valcor. It would be, um, I, you know, again, ADS are the people to speak to that. Um, my understanding is that uh, Spillman has, we, there's still access to the data that are in Spillman because that was the system for, since the 1990s maybe? Years, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, again, ADS are the people to best speak to that. Um, but, you know, the point of that flow chart is these are the systems and it does need to be updated, um, you know, to pull from. And that's just the um, – right, not on that flow chart or that, that mess um, is, is DCF. And DCF system is um, from the 1980s, and they have two systems that you're going to have to pull from. Um, then if you add all the community service providers, uh, so I, there was some discussion yesterday about non-state entities. Um, there are people who have contracts with the state to, to, to provide services. Um, there are, right, and all of that stuff's on spreadsheets. Some people are using access databases. Um, the judiciary's treatment courts didn't move over to Odyssey, uh, and I just got a um, an extract from them that was created in, Microsoft Office 2003, that's, that's the database that they're using. Uh, they, they are about to get a new system. Um, I also want to flag also on, on the laws that affect all of this, and I know you're talking about it in some aspects, is the expungements. Um, but one of the things that we have to map out is, is if the order from expungement happens, do we have to pluck that fish out of the lake? Um, and then nobody gets to see that, that, that fish. Uh, which isn't what we want to happen. We want the Office of Racial Justice Statistics to have the most complete data that they have. Um, so how do you structure those data agreements and data, so that they don't have to expunge? Um, it, and th those are things that really do have to be worked out carefully. Uh, there are two examples that we're using um, to help us guide and to help overcome some of the you can't have that uh, mentality that sometimes people have with data sharing. And one is Virginia, where they have combined um, uh, substance use disorder information and police information um, all in one database. And they, they, look, they look at it as a lake, too. Some people have access to different parts of information, but they're using substance abuse treatment records. And it's a two of the most um, heavily regulated and privacy oriented data sets, criminal justice information and substance use. And they're merging those together um, online. Um, and I can send you guys the link if you want to look it out. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, but we have all of their agreements, trust documents, all the legalese. Um, so that's one. And then um, Iowa also has, uh, has already done this process. They did it a long time ago. Um, and they, um, you know, have a lot of good information on how best to do this. So uh, that I think is... in order to uh, expedite this process, it'd be very important to get uh, state's attorneys, sheriffs, courts, want to rest on the same system. Um, I, uh, I don't know that's necessarily, so data integration, we don't expect everyone to be on the same system. Um, it's kind of ADS's job and other people's job to match across systems, and we're really quite good at that. Um, knowing, you know, making sure that the one advice we give people when they're looking at systems um, is making sure that they can get their data out of their systems, and how much is that going to cost them if they can't do it themselves. Um, you know, added to that, uh, also, what does it cost to change a system? So if you think about some of the discussions that you've had over the years, um, and let's start by adding the gender X um, into our systems, 
that, right? One of the things we're doing in the, in the National Criminal Justice Reform Project is documenting, well, if it's just adding an extra option, what is the process in this system to do that? Who do we have to pay? Is it, can it be done something by somebody here in Vermont? Do we have to pay the vendor? Is there a process to go through to get that change approved? Um, so documenting all of that so that when somebody asks for, can we have information on this group, uh, we know what it takes to collect the data from a technical point of view. So all of that is stuff that needs to be worked out. Thank you. Other questions? So I have one more point, if I'm allowed. Uh, one more question, Robin. Uh, OK. Uh, Representative Goslin. What's the, uh, uh, hi, Robin. Uh, what's hi. the realistic time that we're looking to get this running uh, efficient, efficiently with uh, what, is, what is needed, what's required with all the different agencies and stuff? Uh, that would be an ADS question. I can say that if we look at the toolkit um, that RDAP relied heavily on and look at the reports that already exist, um, certainly with um, you know, my, ourselves uh, and other folks, we can get that office up and running or at least give them the things that they need to do. So um, if you look at the, at the work the Council of State Governments did, uh, the office of justice statistics, racial justice statistics will have access to all that information. Um, they can get the same report from the judiciary that council of state governments got. Um, you know, I'm not speaking for the judiciary, but they can go through the process to get that exact same extract from, this, from the system. So there's a lot of work that can be done once they're up and running. Um, the larger process of data integration, that's an ADS question. So, um I don't think we have anybody here from, from ADS, but I thought uh, that, uh, and it's not their fault, but they're extremely backlogged. And I thought they were dealing with uh, a tremendous amount of outdated equipment to even get close to being caught up is do you know if that is in fact true? Uh, not, not, I am not privy to that information, sir. I know that we have used our funding to pay for a person in ADS to help us with the uh, uh, project management. Um, and again, this is the beginning of the beginning of writing down all of these you know, things that affect the integration. We know that in the next six months, we are not integrating data. Okay. All right. Th um, uh, thank you for now. Uh, Representative uh, Christie, I, I think we really need to get ADS in here and, and, uh, and talk well, with them and, and, and well, find out on, what they're... They're on the list, uh, uh, Representative. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that was a recommendation. And in the original bill, uh, they were a key uh, uh, focus point. Uh, when we did uh, 317. Uh, so it's just gone full circle uh, to bring them back in. Okay, because uh, I, I also know that um, uh, in my former life here, when I was on the select board for 10 years here in town, I also now, uh, you know, know about the uh, backlog with the, um, uh, with the communication and all that stuff, what Representative uh, Norris was talking about, Spillman and all that stuff. I mean, I think oh, that's yeah. still going through a huge uh, overhaul in the state. And then uh, the individual towns are, mm. are uh, trying to find funds and all that stuff for that. So um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work to do. And again, I'm not against this. I'm just trying to get it. So we're doing it right immediately. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the support too. Uh, Representative Colburn. Thank you. Um, I really appreciated Susanna Davis's um, comments about the importance of kind of looking at some of 
these intersectional data questions. Um, and, and she used the example of LG, LGBTQIA folks in the, in the ju with justice system, 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 sorry, whoo, I'm getting tired, system involvement. Um, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, Robin, if you can talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities around, you know, starting to untangle some of those intersections through data, yeah. whether there's anything we could be doing at this stage of kind of drafting and finalizing the bill that could strengthen the, you know, needed resources or whatever it is to help folks be able to get at that work. Yes, thank you. That actually brings me to my second point, which is how to get at the intersectionality. And so I would ask at this point um, if Amber could put up this, the PowerPoint PDF that just one slide so people can get an idea. Um, and our answer to that question is you're not going to do that in administrative data. Um, our answer to the question is we strongly encourage uh, that you include funding for qualitative research um, to get at um, smaller populations and their experiences. Um, and this is why. If you look at that slide, and, and I know the council state governments met with a lot of us uh, independently of their public meetings, and so I'm hoping that a lot of people asked their math questions then about why didn't you tell us about the individual counties, why are we only looking at, at black folks and not anyone else. And so this is five years worth of data um, of people who went, who were charged in our criminal courts by county. And the number of people, and not even individuals, so if somebody was in this, in, in, you know, came into the county twice in the same five years, they're there twice. Um, but you'll see that especially when we get to um, indigenous folks, Latinx folks, Asian folks, that we have a lot of counties where there's five or fewer in five years being charged with criminal complaints in our court system. And so that's one of the reasons why council state governments didn't do counties, didn't do um, different races, because the data aren't there for five years. And actually they used six years and they still didn't have enough data. Uh, when we add into um, the LGBTQIA group, I want to be very clear that what um, we want to be careful, again, echoing, I think, some of the things that Director Davis has said over the years, is that um, prepare for the government that you don't want. And do we really want our government, in particular our criminal justice system, collecting data about people's trans status and their sexual identities? Um, I think that's a, I know what my vote would be. Um, and so there's a question to really think about. And even if we went through that process of asking people to self-identify when they're arrested, um, would we get enough numbers to do the kind of council of state government analysis? And I respectfully submit that we would not. Um, there's a study going on for right now, for example, in New Orleans uh, about how trans people of color experience the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, it is a qualitative study. It is having trouble recruiting people because um, not only are, right, so if we start team, being involved in the criminal justice system is a rare event. And so trying to recruit people who feel comfortable, um, and this is a researcher of color who's doing the, the research. Uh, she's well-versed in, in this uh, community. Um, and it's hard, but they in New Orleans are doing this because they know that they're never going to get one that the government isn't going to collect that, that information, and two that being able to get at that at their experiences really requires talking to people. Um, we got a earmark uh, from Senator Leahy's office um, that will allow us to do qualitative research in the southern part of the state, um, in Bennington, Windsor. 
uh, and Rutland, uh, working with the NAACPs and Curtis's group, to be able to get at how people of color in the southern part of the state experience the justice system, because a lot of times what happens is Chittenden County puts its foot on the scale, um, and what you're seeing is Chittenden County's experience and not Brattleboro's. Uh, so that is our <coughs> main kind of ask in this bill, is that it include more than just statistical data, um, is that it include the stories of people who are affected, who are never going to show up in the data in a mathematically um, robust way. Uh, who's, and so that if, you, if, you're, if we're going to create this office, which we think we should, um, if we're going to create this office, then all we should make sure that we're not institutionalizing any more discrimination by intentionally creating something that is not going to tell those stories. Uh, and that we think that by, you know, one of the things that we're doing in the earmark is working with scholars of color to be able to get them their first publications and, and so on, because a lot of people are... Um, a lot of scholars of color are opting out of traditional academic roles for, for, for a variety of reasons, but white supremacy is one of them. Um, and so how can we encourage as a state more scholars of color to be able to do this work? And I think that this office is one way to do that. So Thank I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you so much. I am just so appreciative of your insight and your answer and as as someone who you know in my other job is a research librarian and an academic yeah. institution just so much of what you said really really resonates with me and i'm so excited to hear about the grant you just talked about and and hope you'll continue to update us on it but just of course strongly support just want to say strongly support everything you said about the need to really think about the role of qualitative research and making sure that's <clears throat> part of the picture and adequately funded here. Okay, Representative Norse. Yes, one quick question, Robin. So it, it bodes yeah. the question, with the lack of sharing of statistics presently, is it in our best interest to actually start this uh, particular project now? or do we wait until we have access to this uh, data sharing? So, uh, oh, I'm not sure I understand the question, sir. Do we have enough data sharing presently? So this yeah. office is very beneficial for the state of Vermont. Oh, sure. I mean, if you found the Council of State Government's uh, report useful um, and their research useful, uh, all of that, right, <laughs> they, 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 they merge that data. Um, so that was using judiciary data and Vermont criminal history data. Um, I recently just finished a study that takes police data um, and merges it with court data and criminal histories to get come up with um, victimization of people um, who are vulnerable or elderly. And what does that population look like? And what do those crimes look like? And what do those offenders look like? So there's lots of data integration that can go on and a lot of really exciting research that we've been doing, that other people have been doing, and that this report, uh, that this office can start with things that are already, these reports that already exist. You don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel, but the wheel is being reinvented outside of this process. And so making sure that, that, that you're part of that process or that this office is part of the process, like we're doing with the Criminal Justice Reform Project, is one of those things that you want to do. So you don't have to wait for everything to be integrated um, and agreed upon, because that's going to take years. But there is enough, an, enough work that we've all done in the, you know, in the state prior to assist this new office um, to be able to, to do some really robust research. Sure. So, Coach, could I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Robin. So, yep. tell me, uh, can you tell me why you support having this uh, office then created? I mean, you're a data researcher and you do a lot of this work already. Why, mm -hmm. why do we need this office? Uh, sure. Um, well, you, need, you need an office that is focused specifically on race and marginalized communities. Um, and that's what this is doing. 
I think that having a group that's dedicated to do that, there are other issues in the criminal justice system, race touches all of them, um, but this is dedicated. It says something from the state of Vermont um, with the qualifier that I recognize our state exceptionalism, but here's a chance to institutionalize the fact that research and data on race and marginalized communities matters that it matters from the legislature, that we have the consensus of a group of people who represent every aspect of the criminal justice system coming together and saying, yes, do this. So we absolutely support it. Um, it's not going to impact our work. We still have lots of research to do. Um, we look forward to working with them as partners and assisting them um, with our knowledge of data integration and, and the systems in Vermont and helping them. Thank you. More research is always better. That's one of those more better things for yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, uh, Madam Chair Grad, uh, should we take a short break um, and then come back to a couple of more witnesses before we, uh, we have to go to the floor at three, right? We do, we do. Yeah. And I want to give, uh, folks some time to transition between here and the floor. So I think if we could push through with, with some of our witnesses, because they are here okay. and, then try to, and then try to take our break um, before the floor. Okay, great. So and coach, then, yes. Coach, could we hear from Witchy Press? Because it follows right on what uh, Robin Joy was talking about as far as data. That uh, it, we were gonna stay on the, on the data track. Uh, you know, because I saw that he got here. So uh, that only stands to reason. Uh, Wiki, would you like to uh, uh, share your thoughts uh, at this point? And then we will hear from um, uh, Dr. Crocker and uh, Attorney Thompson. Sure, no problem. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Uchi Artu, pronouncing him his. Uh, I am uh, professionally a data warehouse engineer. So what, what this whole bill is centered around all of that technological infrastructure, that's that's what I do for my day job. Uh, I, I'm also, although not wearing this hat, second vice president at the NAACP of Wyndham County. So I have a lot of experience with social justice and, and um, activism. So just uh, so I just wanted to first give an overview of why I think this is important, sort of to that question that was asked to Robin. Uh, first, sort of just really talking about the power of of data, uh, and I think, for example, one way that that the power of data has shown up is that uh, you know I helped coordinate the BIPOC vaccine clinics here in Southern Vermont, and the only reason why we were able to do that. Um, it was because we were able to point at the data. We were able to be like, hey, look at this disparity that is happening, um, which didn't happen until we asked for it, right? So all of that accountability, all of that, uh, the ability for the community and community organizations to engage and hold ourselves accountable to the disparity that were happening was only possible because the data existed and because the data was able to be analyzed. Um, and in addition to that, then sort of how did that transfer over to policy making, right? And I am thinking about the recent criminal justice uh, presentation that we had from the Justice Reinvestment, I think, or C. Geez, oh, I'm bad with acronyms. Um, <laughs> point point is, is like right. We were we were they were able to analyze where we are with the court cases and being able to be like, here are some policy recommendations right, based on this data. So being able to do that type of analysis is really important to make informed decisions. Uh, another reason why I think this is important is because of how foundational it is. Uh, when, we th when we think about sort of that, reciting that presentation, right, with it, there was a big point that uh, the disparities in, in the, wasn't happening from the sentencing of courts. Right, the sentencing, the, the disparity was coming from somewhere else. And the point is, we don't know what that's somewhere else because we can't determine because there's no, like, there was, 
there's no integration with those systems right now, right? Like, was it the prosecutor's office? Was it law enforcement? Well, we don't know, right? So we're gonna, so one of the important things is we look at these disparities and we able to like map, right? The, the journey of what it is to be convicted and sort of look at that as a big picture. It, part of that is being able to look at, at the process in whole and we can't do that without integration. Um, I wanna trans, uh, oh, also uh, one more thing about it being foundational. It's when you build this kind of infrastructure, you are building sort of like the foundational basement for a scalable uh, data analytics, right? Because when, you, when you're like, I'm gonna integrate these different departments, you are building the roadblocks to be able to integrate data in general. And therefore we're gonna be able to rely on those resources once you start integrating data with other state agencies. It's gonna be down much easier. Uh, I wanna transfer a little bit over to some specific sections of the bill that sort of stood out to me. Um, and the first one is on page two, section 5011A. Uh, and just wanted to, is the creation within the Office of Racial Equity. Um, and I, I'm inclined to agree a little bit with Rebecca about sort of like really determining where, where it sits and maybe sitting in a place where it's like their governance is around data governance across agencies. Because while I definitely agree that right now the purpose is for racial equity and we should be definitely looking at an intersection with racial identity, uh, I think it's as we, as I look in my crystal ball, right, and look at the future, the ability to the to collect, analyze data based on sexual orientation, gender identity, um, uh, disability, right, mental health, like so many different factions. The, the, we're going to be able, people are going to want to see, okay, well, if we can see race, why can't we just see, you know, LGBTQ plus, right? So that's going to start to happen eventually. And if we think about, well, is the Office of Racial Equity really going to be the place where you want that to happen, where they should actually be focusing on racial justice, mm -hmm. right? So just really thinking about what's going to looking in your crystal ball and seeing where it's going to go and wanting to make sure that it's in the place where you want it to be in the future and not just now um on page five um section 5013a1 um it's about the public records act i i also felt like it was a little um unclear to me about like what was public and what isn't and what's covered under the act I'm not an expert, but I, I imagine that, you know, if the records that were put over were public, then they would stay public. And then if the, that, those that weren't for public records, um, we're gonna just stay not as public records. Um, but I do think sort of to, you know, Go, um, Representative Goslin made a point yesterday of like, well, they're just gonna be able to do whatever with this data. And, you know, I do think that there needs to be some transparency, e even though there are laws around data and data use, there needs to be some transparency out towards the outside. And I would propose something called the data sheets, which basically it, 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 you, don't, you don't share the data. What you share is what are you collecting? Where are you collecting it from? Um, and more or less, how are you collecting it? So there is some transparency to the public, to the legislature. We can always look at what's seeing, what it is that they're collecting and making sure that, we're, that everyone else is a, always aware, not, not just like some secret entity uh, doing some secret stuff, right? Uh, the net, I have a few more edits here. Um, page six, 5013 uh, C. Um, I do think that there should be some explicit um, guidelines on governance around uh, data analysis, very specifically what the data should not be used for. Um, definitely not intentionally causing harm. It should, um, the data should not be used for surveillance or identifiable analysis, uh, and it should not be used to monitor individuals. It should be, there should, the data should be used to look at population based and never an individual. Um, when you get to the minute, like the data at analysts will probably be looking at the individuals because they have to in order to do this work, but anything exiting out um, of those privileged people uh, should not have access to that because of the repercussions that it can have. Uh, I also think that in that governance, um, in the data analytics, there should be some explicitness around 
that we should always be trying to prove that we're wrong, that our systems are wrong and how to improve them and never to reinforce necessarily the cor like the correctness of of our systems because if we try to say hey our system's correct our system's correct we're going to be biased towards reinforcing the the drawbacks of our systems we can reinforce like the correctness of our systems by proving what's wrong about them but never the, the other way uh, so in for my next edit i would suggest um, it's on page seven, five zero one four B one L. I I do agree with um, Attorney Turner about um, making sure that that substance use uh, is separated out as a specific person, just because of how much more prevalent it was in the data from that from the presentation we saw with the reinvest justice uh, names. Um, so making sure that that's separated. Um, I also think in page eight, five zero one four B2, it just sort of has like a general state that we should have, you know, marginalized folks um, within, within that, uh, within, the, within the council. I, I do think that there should be some explicitness about who those marginalized communities are, because I want to just make sure that, you know, that that is in legislation. We're not saying like marginalized communities that I'm sort of like up to interpretation. I do think that there should be like, well, folks with disabilities, folks from the LGBTQ plus community, folks, you know, uh, just kind of that language. That's my own personal opinion. And uh, I have two other points. Um, one point, uh, just agreeing with Robin about qualitative data. When we talk about data analytics from the data warehousing side um, and from the data lake side. We talk a lot about quantitative data and being able to run analytics and statistics on those. And that will certainly tell you what, where, um, and what is happening with whom, but it, it won't necessarily tell you how or why. And that qualitative data is gonna be so important being able to go that much deeper, um, especially in examining our biases because we, we to a certain level, we have to make some assumptions when we do quantitative data analytics. So qualitative data is also like an additional check that we can place on those assumptions to make sure that we you know, are able to grab as many perspectives as we can in our analytics. And finally, um, just a note on the concern for, um, from Representative Goslin, um, I do think that it, uh, about you know, how feasible, when will it happen? I do think that you know, there, it is important to understand that data warehousing is sort of like, you could do sort of like so much with it or you can do like very little with it. Um, and I think it's gonna be important, uh, uh, sorry. I think this council is gonna be an important part of this because the council is gonna include all the stakeholders that hold data in addition to members of the public representing who the data is gonna analyze, right? So being able to all be at one table, deciding what is priority, deciding what can be done and when it can be done, that's gonna be extremely important to be able for us to get what we want when we want it and look to the future of what else could we prioritize and how do we prioritize it. Uh, I know that was a lot. Please feel free to ask questions or let me know your concerns or anything that I could help support. Well, I, uh, just a quick uh, comment uh, for folks who aren't uh, familiar uh, with our particular witness. Uh, he's been actively involved uh, on a number of um, working groups and task force. Uh, he's been working with uh, uh, Director Davis uh, on her task force. He's worked on the working group task force with the SEC and a number of other activities. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to have that level of energy, Jason, can we bottle that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Coach. <laughs> uh, any questions uh, to Mr. R2? See, that's very telling, Ricky. I think you did a great job explaining uh, your thoughts. You know, 
Thank you. Thank Great you, job. Um, so um, we, why don't we ask um, uh, Professor Crocker to um, join us and then uh, uh, oh, Attorney Thompson, I think, will you be able to rejoin us? Uh, we're gonna have a short uh, floor. Uh, what do you think, Madam Chair? Back at about 3.30 or something? Well, that's what I thought, but now I'm hearing that may not be the case. Um, actually, um, Selena, do you want to chime in? Because I did not hear that directly. Sure. Yeah, I just heard it. Um, and it, so it sounds like we originally we were going to just do bill introduction today, and that would be it. But it sounds like we're going to suspend rules to take up S-222, which is around some kind of emergency provisions for town meeting mm. stuff. So, you know, it could be really quick if there's not a lot of debate, but it's, it sort of just depends how it goes. Um, and I just I just heard that minutes ago to myself. Yeah, thank you. I, mean, I know we all we also have um, two other witnesses from this morning in the budget. So, um, but why don't we um, um, hear from um, Professor Crocker and then hopefully um, uh, Attorney Thompson can come back uh, next week or when we take this up next. But hopefully, hopefully it'll be next week. Professor, um, good afternoon. Hi, I'll be really quick. So. I'm, um, for the record, I'm Abby Crocker. I'm a research professor at the University of Vermont's uh, Justice Research Initiative and a research partner at the National Center on Restorative Justice. Um, I will keep my comments really, really brief um, and just highlight that I support this bill um, and specifically from the perspective and out of an external researcher. Um, I was really encouraged to see the language specifically in the bill about external researchers. Um, because as an external researcher who does work with justice systems and, you know, in a mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative component, access to justice data systems is um, extremely challenging. And what happens is when I, you know, if I want to do a project with, say, like DCF and the courts, um, I have to go to each of those separate entities and negotiate a data sharing agreement. Um, develop a data spec, somebody within their office has to talk to me, uh, create that extract and, and share it with me. And, and that's a very time consuming, um, complicated process for, for them and for me. Um, and what I view as a huge benefit of this entity is that this creates a centralized location within state government to do all that work and to do it once. So that I would hope I could go to this division and say, I have this research project, it's policy relevant, it's grounded in um, racial equity, it's, you know, meets these certain criteria, can you help? And can we partner on this? And then that organization can be the one to say, yeah, we've, we've, we've negotiated these different data sharing agreements and here we can create this plan and we can um, share data with you. And, and so I think that's, one of the huge things from an external researcher perspective, and I've got other perspectives as well of why I, I support this, um, but keeping comments brief, that's a, a really big one, is um, it will actually open the door to a lot of researchers who have not had access um, to these kinds of systems, which I actually think um, will mean we'll be able to increase the amount of policy relevant research we can do in the state. Um, sort of exponentially. And what I like about the infrastructure and how it's grounded is that it will be done under the sort of careful um, eye and collaboration of this advisory council. So it's, you know, inherently leans towards a participatory approach where it's not someone taking it and doing something in isolation. It's, it's something that's relevant um, and collaborative for the state. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Well, that, that was great to hear because, uh, believe it or not, that was kind of the intention. <laughs> uh, Representative Lalonde, and thanks for that uh, uh, validation. We're heading in the right direction. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abby, for uh, showing up. I can say Abby instead of professor because uh, <laughs> Abby and I know each other from South Burlington here. Just a real quick question, and it may, you may need to ponder this a little bit. Uh, I've heard now from a couple witnesses, witnesses, and also you, as far as having qualitative data. And I have to figure out how to ask or put that into a bill. I mean, to, to have stories provided and such. You probably don't have an answer for that. It's probably more of a question for legislative council. But if you have any ideas in, in what you've dealt with in how one actually seeks such qualitative data from government entities. Again, you may not have an answer. No. If you do, great. I can say it would be a challenge within this organization because it's highly sensitive information. Um, so I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Um, I'd have to think about it a little bit more, but you know, in my perspective, the benefit is an external researcher can highlight qualitative data, but the, the real resource we're getting here is this growing organization that can help us leverage administrative data. And knowing leveraging the administrative data, there's like, we're so far from perfection, but we taking that first step is the key. And um, I view it as an opportunity where not only will we learn what data sets to build, but we'll learn how, we're, how we can collect data differently, how we can share definitions across organizations a little bit differently. Um, so there's just a ton of room for improvement within our existing data definitions as well as systems. But I don't think we should wait for perfection to start. Like, I think that's 20 years away. Like, I think it's start now. We have lots of great stuff. Move forward um, and and use what we have for good. And I'll think more about the qualitative piece, but. Thank you. Well, well uh, thank you very much. And, you know, I, I thinking in terms of, you know, the ability and capability of potential uh, uh, researchers that are doing uh, postgraduate work and doing their masters and their doctorates in very specific areas, being able to help this bureau mm -hmm. grow as a result of you know that external researcher uh, activity. Uh, you know that's that's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it expands the capability of work in this area. So, so I'm just really excited and thank you so much for your great uh, contributions to the process. Any other questions for Professor Crocker? Well, Abby, thank you so much. And, and, and we probably will probably have you back, you know, we've, you know, this, this isn't a one and done discussion, we want to make sure we, uh, we put a bill, you know, to the body that uh, can get across the finish line, and it's going to take all of us. So thank you. Madam Chair.